I was making notes and decided, okay, it's time to start putting it into a book form, and it became a service. One thing always leads to another, and that's what drives me. I suffered from migraines when I was really young, from like the second to seventh or eighth grade. And this man, who was a scientist, would take away the migraines. And so I thought, this is a really magical guy. He's like an alien type of a guy. They, they weren't rebels, but they were butting up against really big systems. The guy that was proving he could take sewage, zap it with sound or frequencies, and get clean water out the other end. They set up shop in Midland, Michigan, which is the headquarters of Emical, and they got squashed like bugs. And I'm thinking, though, these are remarkable people that are doing remarkable things, yet, how come the FBI is always involved? How come there's always some corporation that's suing them into the ground to make sure that these, these patents are never known to the public? And that was kind of like my first wake-up call that, hey, you know, you can have great ideas, but they're not always going to be as well received as you might like. I, uh, my family in, in, in Detroit, we weren't particularly religious. So off I go to the local bookstore and I find this brand new, it was an international bestseller at this time. The book was called Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And the premise of the book was the crucifixion was a hoax. Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married. They had children. Uh, there were certain secrets that Jesus possessed that the traditional church, the Catholic church, does not want people to know about. And I was instantly hooked. I didn't know anything about Christianity. I was like, wow, if, this, if they wanted to eliminate these people, what was it that they knew? I ended up writing a 44-page review of this book, and I was flunked. And the professor sat me down and said, uh, you're at a Southern Baptist college. Do you believe any of this crap? And I'm like, well, yeah, I think that book really laid out a very compelling case. And, and he said, well, if you really believe that, then you might consider continuing your education somewhere else. And that's what I did. And I'm still trying to answer that same fundamental question. It, it, it was a huge wake-up call because, I, again, I didn't fully appreciate the role of religion in people's lives because it wasn't a huge part of our lives. So it left me kind of bewildered. I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm here to get an education. I'm asking really important questions. Do you think I would be applauded for wanting to address the most important questions of Christianity right off the bat? But in fact, the response was the exact opposite. It's like, this has been decided long before your time. This stuff is nonsense. We don't want to hear it. I only lasted two years at the college. And that was the, the end of that story. When I first tapped into these mysteries, it was kind of a lonely road. My sisters were into it. My family was into it. Thanksgiving conversation at our house was always about this type of mysteries or conspiracy theory, but my friends didn't get it at all. So it became kind of a lonely road. It was a little scary, but I think I had this entrepreneurial spirit from my father that you could make something happen. You could build a business or you could make connections and contacts and, and do it yourself. And that really became kind of the, the rule of my life. I worked for a self-help entrepreneur who, is, who made hundreds of millions of dollars selling subliminal tapes on late night TV. How to lose weight, how to quit smoking, and he was very famous. And he appreciated that I liked to do research and he had a book deal. And he hired me to read books for him. I did this for almost three years. And so every month he would call with a question. How does the brain work? Why do people fail? How do people lose weight? And it'd be hysterical. My parents would be like, oh, God, what's the question this month? You know? And that was a wonderful experience for me. I mean, he just gave me free reign to, to go out and explore. And it was then I started to kind of, I got off the reservation a little bit because I started to put my own input into it, my own perspective. And of course, that wasn't suiting him because he really wanted it to be about his story. But that kind of put me into a whole new area. It's like, okay, I'm gonna, I really enjoy the writing. And then I read Zachariah Sitchin's books and about the ancient Anunnaki and Sumerian mythology about the extraterrestrial intervention in human affairs and said, this is what I really, really want to get into. This whole question of extraterrestrials, especially in the ancient past. First question that really drove my research was, who is Jesus really? And, and what did Jesus actually teach? Not what the Bible says he taught. This is a fourth century Coptic Christian depiction of Jesus with his rod and his ring his two key pieces of technology that were then taken out of his hands, and he's just simply shown waving his hand, performing his miracles. But in example after example of early Christian art, he had this rod and ring in his hand. As I look at ancient astronaut theory, as proposed by Eric von Donneken, Zachariah Sitchin, and other authors, I, I love their work, but something that I find, I have a slightly different perspective on it, and that is that there's a very definite dependence that some have on the belief that the gods were flesh and blood beings, and they had super advanced technology. But as I dug deeper and deeper into the subject, I found it a more compelling argument that these extraterrestrials are not in flesh and blood form. They can take on flesh and blood form, and that their primary motivation for coming here is not to give us technology. It's rather to assist us in activating the latent capab capabilities of our body, to transform, to become like the gods. And that is a, a completely different path. If, if you're looking at these ancient stories of extraterrestrials for the, wow, the big wow of, wow, look at the size of that flying saucer, or what technology did they have? Your chances are not looking to apply it to your own personal life. You're not looking for the, the ultimate secrets of how we transform. 
And that's what started to really drive my research into the extraterrestrial phenomena is how they came here to assist us in our personal and spiritual evolution, not just a, a technological evolution.